which him, the focus is to save a life. The date stamp today is 29th of January, Friday, Singapore time, 5 p.m. This session is brought to you by the APSC, endorsed by the Singapore Cardiac Society, as well as the Asian Pacific Society of Interventional Cardiology, proudly uh, supported uh, by Medtronic. So my name is Jack. I'm from Singapore, the current president of the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology. I'm your moderator for the session today. Uh, our speaker uh, is Professor Tan Hui Chim, Senior Consultant and Director of the National University Heart Center Singapore. He's going to narrate to us a series of cases on unusual causes of AMI. Our panel professoral uh, inputs will come from Professor Morton Kern, Professor of Medicine and Chief of Cardiology at the Veterans Administration Long Beach Healthcare, University of California, Irvine from the States. It's 1 a.m. Uh, there for Professor Kern, so I hope he shows up uh, and provides his inputs. Uh, we also have Professor Ashok Seth. He's very uh, well known in this part of the world. He's the chairman of the Fortis Escort Heart Institute and the chairman of the Cardiology Council Fortis Grove Hospital from India. He's the current president of the Asian Pacific Society of Interventional Cardiology. We have two uh, of our interventional fellows, Darling in Life, to provide the live interaction. We have Dr. Ku Che Yang Christopher from the National University Heart Center, Singapore, as well as Dr. Anand from Pakistan. So they would provide the live interaction uh, required uh, to stimulate our professors with their heart questions. Now, of course, we're gonna put them on the spot to answer some of the questions as well. This webinar is copyrighted by the APSC and should not be distributed without the prior permission of the APSC. The views and opinions expressed in the webinars are those of the faculty members and do not necessarily represent those of the APSC. This content is currently made available by live stream on Wonder Medicine Facebook, as well as the YouTube pages for APSC. The session is also accredited for CME points by EBEC for regional uh, attendees. For Singapore registered physicians, CME point will also be awarded uh, if you are connected throughout the whole duration of this webinar, you will receive your certificate or attendance upon completing a survey sent by email post uh, webinar. If you have any uh, questions, feedback on the cases that are going to be discussed, feel free to type it in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer every question submitted. So the objective of today's session is a discussion around a few uh, unusual noteworthy cases that Professor Tan has collected over his last 25 years of cath lab experience. And we want to look out really for unusual causes of acute myocardial infarction. We also want to learn from the professors in the panel and from each other, how to avoid and pick up and treat these uh, cases. Uh, a pitch, we have another upcoming webinar next week. It's the APSC's uh, Champions League my most memorable and best teaching case in STEMI care. So we're gonna put the regional um, KOLs to compete with each other when they present their best teaching case for STEMI care and the audience will get to vote on the winner. So do join us next week uh, at 3 p.m. Singapore time. So let's uh, get uh, started with uh, Professor Tan's uh, uh, series of unusual cases or oh, AMI. Prof Tan, please. Prof, you are muted at the Thank moment. Thank you very much, uh, Jack. I'm yeah. going to share my slide now. Okay, so, uh, so we're going to go jump straight to the first case. Now, this is a 38-year-old Indian national, has got uh, risk factors of diabetes and hypertension and hyperlipidemia. And uh, he was admitted to a regional hospital twice in the last three months for recurrent bilateral lower limb swelling, pain, and fever. Now, he was diagnosed to have superficial uh, saphenous vein thrombophobitis, and then he was treated with antibiotic and NSAID. 
uh, there were some investigations uh, carried out at that time. Uh, ultrasound venous uh, Doppler scan of the lower limb just showed thrombosis of the great saphenous vein and bilateral superficial saphenous veins. There was no deep venous thrombosis. Thrombophilia screen was negative. He also underwent a whole series of uh, uh, CT scan just to exclude any malignancy given his recurrent uh, phlebitis. Uh, there was no malignancy. There were some prominent inguinal lymph nodes. That's about it. However, in a gastroscopy, there was evidence of uh, non-erosive gastritis and gastric ulcers in the ent entrum. Colonoscopy was normal. His tumor markers were all negative. Now, I said he was admitted twice in the last three months. The day after he was discharged in the second admission, he complained of central crushing chest pain while he was in his dormitory. So these are all foreign workers. And this was associated with diaphoresis. The vitals were relatively okay. The blood pressure was 126. It was tachycardic. He wasn't in heart failure. So this is the ECG. Maybe so maybe I can break the ice and get Chris to start off by commenting on the ECG. Sure. So I think it shows um, inferior ST elevations. Um, but reciprocally, there's not... I mean, there's some suggestion of mild reciprocal changes, but I think the main thing is uh, inferior ST elevations. I wouldn't Enough for you to activate the for the cath lab. So you, you, you think you'll bring this patient to the cath lab? With the history and an ECG like that, I still would. Any idea of the corporate lesion? If anything, it's the RCA, but it's not the most classic. I, I wouldn't say it's a classic uh, uh, ST elevation in the US. Then. So that's an interesting question, which I would like to ask uh, Ashok. What are the pointers on ECG that tells you culprit lesion if you have inferior ST? Ashok, okay, you're muted. Sorry, Ashok, you may want to unmute yourself first. Right, have I unmuted myself? So yes, obviously yes. one would consider the right-sided leads. Uh, that's an important aspect to see whether this ST elevation does go on the right-sided leads. Obviously, there's no reciprocal ST segment depression, but that would just indicate more, uh, more a very proximal RCA. Uh, this could be a distal RCA. And of course, I would immediately follow that up also with an echocardiogram, which is very rapidly done, at least in our center, right in the ER to diagnose whether there's inferior hypokinesis in this patient. So we Chima, classically I was taught uh, that this one looks very localized to the inferior leads. It looks slightly higher two versus three, mm -hmm. and there's no tall R waves in the precordial leads, no SE elevation uh, in V1. So it looks very isolated and I mean, in the Indian chat, I find some of them could be a distal cirque as well. Some that can present like this. If you, I'm not thinking of the unusual cases, I'm thinking of classical in my <laughs> cases. Yeah, okay. please, uh, please go ahead, yeah. All right. So this is the angiogram. This is the left coronary artery. Looks pretty okay. Maybe. Do you agree? Looks generally all right. A bit of bridging right in the mid segment. This is the right coronary artery. So Dr. Anand, uh, you have any comments? So, uh, except the bridging in the mid LED, otherwise I did not find any significant abnormality in RCA and LED. Do you want to look at the RCA again? What do you see? Maybe the pro, maybe the osteal RCA. Yeah, there is a blockage in the osteo proximal RCA. Yeah, there is a haziness, and that's likely the thrombus in the osteo proximal RCA. Any other observation from Chris? Huh? Anything you would like to add? Other than the filling defect in the proximal RCA. Um, I guess you always have to entertain other differentials for the bridging in the mid-LED. So, I mean, um, 
I mean, other differentials with dissection and all that, if we are going down the rare causes of an MI. But I think the main thing in the right side will be just the main filling defect in the... <coughs> Ashok, anything from you? Yeah, so so very clearly, there's got uh, diseased proximal LED, high-grade stenosis, which looks either a dissection or a thrombus formation. Uh, so to, the, the differential diagnosis, to my mind, in a young individual, though this is not a lady, because the fact that given the past history of thrombophlebitis, does he have increased thrombogenic tendency? I, I, I didn't remember whether he was a heavy smoker or not, but he seems to have yeah. increased thrombogenicity. Uh, I, I don't know whether this is a high homocysteine level in this patient, but pro properly, probably that is thrombus in the proximal LED, but could be a spontaneous dissection as well. Thanks, Asho. I, I have slightly different thoughts. So since we change showing unusual causes, given the history of previous DVT, deep vein thrombosis, I'm also entertaining uh, uh, consideration of embolic causes uh, rather than spontaneous plug ruptures. So it could be a right to left embolic uh, from the venous side, right, if he has a significant shunt. Uh, so that's par paradoxical uh, uh, cardiac embolus is one thing I'm entertaining. Uh, I noted that there is some disease in the coronary artery, but otherwise it looks quite clean, uh, except for the filling defect in the proximal RCA. So, I mean, that's one thought uh, that came to mind. Thanks, uh, Huichi, maybe you'll take us through. So the operator, of course, uh, go ahead and do a thrombectomy. Uh, didn't uh, there's still a, a residual uh, filling defect that you can see in the uh, still picture here, but the rest of the artery looks fairly okay if you uh, if you agree. You know, it's a little bit unusual. Uh, why he only has this uh, thrombosis at the osteum, a proximal segment of the RCA. So would you stand it? Uh, would you go ahead and stand it or, or, or you just leave it alone or you give him some anticoagulants and bring him back again or? Uh, this or one, I think I'll go back to the fellows. I think uh, it's, it's good to hear what they're thinking now. So you, you have TME3 flow, you have a hazy filling defect, yeah. aspirated some. Would you place a stance with TME? Uh, Chris, maybe you first. So this is a, with the assumption that we've aspirated thrombus then. So we are going with the idea that this is a... Uh, thrombus as the etiology. Uh, I'm not sure whether there was anything aspirated, but there was an aspiration attempt. I guess in a, uh, a possibility is always to image just to make sure that there's no dissection there to exclude the etiology. And I think if you've excluded dissection and um, we think that this is uh, potentially thrombus, given the fact that the outflow looks okay, I think it's okay to consider stenting in this, in this case. Can we get some professional uh, professorial guidance from Ashok? Yeah, so... Um, so so this is very interesting. And I think those ECGs below, we still show ST segment elevation. Uh, now, if I had a lesion, if I had a good TME3 flow, and I was sure it was thrombus alone, I'd be very happy to leave it and then uh, put him on, you know, give him intracoronary 2B3A, followed by heparin and bring him back in a week's time to just assess that. It, it, and, and in majority of the patient, it clears up quite dramatically if we leave with a TB3 flow. On the other hand, we want to make sure that there's no plaque rupture, dissection. And that's what my biggest concern is. I assume that he hasn't, primarily because he's a 38 year old and shouldn't have enough atherosclerosis. And we didn't see much atherosclerosis down this vessel at all. So I think I would actually just do an IVAS in this, make sure there's no dissection, and then be happy to leave him with a TB3 flow on, uh, and maybe give intracoronary 2 b 3 followed by heparin, and uh, that would be my strategy. Bring him back a week later. That's definitely an approach, uh, which in my, if I want to leave it, I would use the OCT and differentiate between whether there's some erosions I can pick up or dissection. If there is a plug dissection for the osteo right location, uh, as a cause for this uh, haziness and thrombus, I'll still be more inclined to stent it. Yeah. Okay, so Remember maybe- uh, Diabetes has a risk factor as well although he's yeah. a young. So anyway, the operator went ahead and stands it. So this is the final result. Looks uh, pretty okay, reasonable. But remember, we still have a young man with uh, AMI. Huh? So he was well. And in the ward team uh, who reviewed him the following day, he complained of a painful genital ulcer. 
he denies any sexual exposure. He's here alone. His wife is back in India. Uh, no other sexual partners. And he also has an unintentional loss of weight uh, of five kilograms over the last one year. So this was the ulcer that was noted. On the left is the penile ulcer. On the right is the scrotal ulcer. This ulcer looks pretty discreet and defined. Uh, it's a clean base. There's no discharge and so far, if you will agree with me. Okay. It was uh, painful. I, then, I, I think we should get our cardiology uh, fellows to comment on the ulcer. Not something we look at commonly. Uh, so Dr. Anand, what is your best guess? So uh, I think the Bechet disease could be the best guess with the ulcers, genital ulcers, and with the, uh, this thrombus. So I think the Bechet disease is my guess in this patient. Okay, Chris, Chris, your thoughts. Patches. I know, I agree. One, once you mentioned that the ulcers and a young gentleman with what seems to be a vasculitic kind of picture, prothrombotic, I think Bechet's has to be the first diagnosis in this case now. Not, not okay. But anyway, uh, Prof. Ashok, maybe a more experience as well? Not, not really any more than what they are. <laughs> they're, they're far more intelligent than this uh, than, than I would have thought. But yes, vasculitis comes really on top of the mind uh, with whatever has been happening in the past. Uh, the thrombus uh, uh, causing the acute MI and then ulcers, and just the commonest cause is Bechet. So, so I would agree with that. This doesn't seem to be to be. Yeah, but I I, I don't trust uh, sexual history here. You have a young man living alone without his wife. I think I still entertain STDs, man. So uh, syphilitic chancoid <laughs> uh, is also. Well, that's a good thought. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, which him, but I don't know how to link that together though. Which him? We'll go on. So when we look at his lower limbs, uh, there was some uh, evidence of uh, fibrillitic changes. And uh, when we look at his hands, interestingly, uh, in those areas that he had actually had a puncture or blood drawn, uh, there's some papillal changes on, on his hands. Any comment? So I, I, as a priority, as a moderator, I'll defer to Ashok again. No, so, so what did you say was on his hands? Some papules and uh, papular changes. You know, there's some lumps. Mm -hmm. That's there's not pathology, lumps. is it, Prof? Did he have erythema or uh, some? I don't know. So uh, what mm -hmm. do you think? This is erythema or uh, donosum? Uh, Chris, you are saying? What do you say? No, erythema nodosum, I think it's mainly in the shins. Is that, um, yep. I, I don't know, is it pathogy? You know, that classically comes with bashes. Okay, anyone? Anand, I'm clueless. No, I don't know. I am. I'm also clueless, sorry. Okay, clueless is good. So we ask for a second opinion, right? Uh, we ask someone in our department, someone else will have a consult. So it's good that cardiologists recognize when they are clueless even the, the professors. So uh, maybe Huichin would like to take us through. So we actually, uh, when we did the physical examinations uh, thoroughly on him, uh, so he has scrotal and penile ulcer. He has probitic veins over his lower limbs. He has got this papules on his hands and we actually noted some healing uh, after salsa in his mouth as well. Uh, but there was no conjunctivitis. So your diagnosis? We'll go down the line then. Uh, Anand? Bachelor disease. Chris? Bachelor's disease. Professor Ashok? Yep, same. I, I don't know. I think I think I'll agree with the rest of the three. I have no other better ideas. <laughs> Thanks, Richie. Hmm. Maybe you'd like to let us know. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's great. Bachelor's disease, huh? So what, what is this disease actually? Uh, so this is a disease that was uh, named after a Turkish dermatologist, uh, uh, Dr. Bashez, in 1937. Uh, it's an unknown etiology. It actually involves vasculitis in all the arteries and veins of all sizes. Uh, it tends to be quite common in the Mediterranean populations associated with HLA-B51. Now, this is a men's disease. So this is unlike a lot of uh, rheumatological disorders where, or vasculitic disorder where it's a women's more preponderant, but this is a male disease and it's tend to be more severe. Uh, there's no specific diagnostic test uh, for the diagnosis of this condition. 
But what we do know is that there's some kind of genetic predisposition. Doesn't mean that he's going to inherit it from somebody, but it's just that he's predisposed to it. And with some environmental trigger, uh, some immune response is activated and there's an increased production of pro-inflammatory cytokines leading to an inflammatory process. And the inflammation in Bouchet's disease is a chronic one, so it doesn't go away. So it, it just, uh, it may come on, uh, subside, and then next moment it's going to come on again. So it's a chronic inflammatory process. And so to diagnose this uh, Bouchet's disease, actually you need one major criteria plus any of the two uh, minor criteria. And the major criteria is actually a oral ulceration. And then you can have uh, genital ulcerations, eye lesions, skin lesions, or pathology as what uh, Chris Koo was uh, mentioning about. So this is an oral lesion, so a typical aptus ulcer, which can find on the mucous membrane or on the tongue as well. Or you could have a, uh, patients with ocular lesions with uveitis. And oftentimes when you look at the retina, you could have a retina vasculitis as well. So referral to ophthalmologist is important in this group of patients. And this is a skin lesion, erythema or nodosum on the lower limbs, pyoderma gangrenosum, and uh, thrombophobitis. And what is pathogy? So pathogy is, uh, is defined as more than five millimeter lesion that appears 24 to 48 hours after skin prick by a mm -hmm. needle. So this patient has got an exacerbated skin injury response from a minor trauma. And so when you poke him, you just develop this. Initially looks like a pustule, then becomes a papules and then heal. So this is what we call a pathogy classic of uh, Bouchard's disease. And so sometimes they can have systemic manifestations as well arthritis, and gastrointestinal ulcerations and fistula. So indeed, this patient had an ulcer, if you recall, on his endoscopy. Uh, sometimes they can have meningo encephalitis and neurological deficits, blindness, and they have higher risk of miscarriage if it's a uh, woman uh, infected. But how does Bouchard's disease affect the cardiovascular system, which is more important to us as cardiologists? So it can affect the vascular, uh, vasculature, so it can cause arthritis uh, art involving the arterial and venous. And this uh, inflammation can result in stenosis, thrombosis, and aneurysm formation. In fact, superficial vein thrombosis is more common than deep venous thrombosis. And so patients can have venous uh, complications such as IVC thrombus formation resulting in butt Chiari syndrome or dural sinus uh, thrombosis in the brain. The prognosis in patients with arterial involvement is poor, especially in those who develop pulmonary artery and thoracic aortic aneurysms. They can also have aortitis. So this is a pictures of a patients with pulmonary artery aneurysms, so huge uh, artery, uh, pulmonary artery aneurysms here on the chest X-ray and CT scan and geography as well. So what about cardiovascular complications? So a patient with Bouchers can have pericarditis, which is the commonest involvement of the heart. Then he can have myocarditis, endocarditis, intracardiac thrombosis, which is within the heart chamber. And myocardial infarction can certainly happen in about 17% of patients with or without a pre-existing coronary arthritis. In fact, it's very difficult to diagnose coronary arthritis. Uh, patients can have endomyocardial fibrosis and coronary aneurysm as well. So this is a patient with intracardiac thrombosis with Bouchard's disease before treatment and after treatment. So the AMI in Bouchard's disease was actually published, uh, uh, way first report was in 1982. Uh, it could be secondary to the pre-existing cardiovascular risk factor or uh, uh, underlying uh, arthritis resulting in occlusion. But as I said before, it's very difficult to diagnose coronary artery vasculitis, but it can be suspected if the coronary artery uh, and geography shows a normal coronaries. The difference here is that when you diagnose AMI in Bouchard's disease, you don't treat with statins and so forth. You actually treat with high dose steroids and immunosuppression as part of your uh, treatment regimen. So in, if you look at this series of 52 patients, uh, of which six of them uh, with Bouchard's disease has got cardiac uh, condition, 86% were male. And those with uh, cardiac lesions are likely to have arterial and venous involvement. And five years, five years survival rate is poor in those with cardiac involvement versus those without. So that's Bouchard's disease presenting with acute myocardial infarction. And the treatment here is uh, aspirin for superficial thrombophobitis. 
culture, same for pericarditis, anticoagulation when you see thrombus, except in pulmonary artery aneur aneurysm, cautions is uh, advised with regard to uh, anticoagulation. But pregnisolone is to be used for isolated mucocutaneous disease. Uh, but you may have to consider aggressive immunosuppressive treatment for Bechet's disease with end organ damage or ongoing vasculitis. As for our Indian patients here, uh, he was checked out for STD uh, as what uh, Jack wanted to do. We screened him for chlamydia, gonorrhea, uh, herpes, and uh, all were negative. He was referred to eye, there was nothing in his eye, uh, retina, and he was started on pregnisolone and then hydroxychloroquine and followed by subsequently is a tar brain and he's currently still in remission. Excellent, so that, Yeah, so I, I mean, I must say, I'm not seen a bachelor disease with vasculitis. So I'll defer to Ashok. Ashok, any experience points? Uh, you're still muted, sorry, Ashok. So firstly, no experience. Secondly, I've now understood a lot more about it than I ever knew before about bachelors. So thank you, Ichi. Okay. Uh, that, is, that is also a good uh, 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 review of uh, Beshe's. And the third point is, I would have thought such a patient would also be on anticoagulation, uh, and he isn't. Uh, he may not be on antiplatelets. He did have an MI, uh, but he could have been on anticoagulation. So what's the thought behind that? I think that Yet, there, was, there was some initial, uh, because he was stented, so he was actually given antiplatelet therapy. Oh, yeah, he was stented, yeah but there was no anticoagulant uh, prescribed. Right, because he had thrombophlebitis and then he had thrombosis in the coronary arteries. Mm. So, so just the, you know, once, once there's cardiac involvement and thrombus formation, I agree that antiplatelet therapy perhaps became need needed because of the stent, but whether he would be on long-term anticoagulation, I don't know. Mm. Something just as a thought. Mm. I guess he goes into remission in a few weeks and, and therefore won't require it, I guess. Thanks. So we move on to the next interesting case. Am I? There are a few more to go. So remember, this is a this is second case. is a forty two year old Chinese male, uh, no cardiovascular risk factor of, of note at all. He's a crane operator. He was just having his shower when he presented with sudden onset of chest pain of two hours duration. And this is the ECG. What do you think? So we get uh, Anand now to comment on the ECG. Uh, Dr. Anand, what are we going to do? risk factors in a young man, relatively young. So there are ST elevation in lead B2, V3, V4, V5, B6, but there are no reciprocal ST depression in inferior leads. So uh, so would you bring this patient to the cath lab or thrombolize him? So uh, it's a young patient. I would like to have, as we have available echocardiogram in emergency, I would like to do echocardiogram to rule out any other abnormality. And then if there's segmental wall motion abnormality, then yes, I would like to bring him to the cattle. Chris? Yeah, I mean, with a history like that, I think I would. But I'd just like to make sure there's also not a dissection. So either a quick x-ray or you know, a quick echocardiogram just to make sure there's no signs of a dissection as well. As an aortic dissection you're referring to? Aortic dissection. Okay. Uh, which in? Angiogram first, since this is a classic uh, ST elevations MR on the ECG. But look at the angiogram. So we'll go down back to Chris first. Then what do you see? I think the distal left, the distal LED is definitely occluded, but that it seems a bit out of proportion for the ECG findings that you would get. Other than the distal aspect, that I don't think I see anything really wrong with the rest of his coronaries on the left. Okay, so it was blocked off here. Another view. Okay. Dr. Anand, if you have any comments, feel free. I agree with the Chris. Digital LED is occluded. So. so what would you do now? So I will uh, try to do wire that digital to uh, wire the LED. Would you do aspiration or just do ballooning? So I will do the wire and then we'll do the aspiration. Chris, is that what your thought? 
in NUHS? I think, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, routine trombo aspiration isn't the, the, the standard, but I think in this case, because it is quite clean as coronaries, um, I think I will try and suck as well. Okay, so we'll see what you find. So Asha, would you aspirate or are you just ballooning? No, I would, I would just uh, wire it, balloon it, and then assess what the thrombus burden is. And I would just consider an embolic thrombus in, in such a situation. Uh, so I don't think it's a plaque rupture. I don't think it's a, I, I think they could be a, so, you know, it's, it's a, something to, to consider. So yeah, I would wire it, I'd just balloon it, and then assess the whole situation. But I wouldn't routinely thrombo aspirate it. Mm. But if I, you think it's embolic, wouldn't it be reasonable to aspirate? Uh, I think wiring it, two millimeter balloon, assess. So my, my usual approach is if I that's see what a, my usual approach is. Yeah. Wire so balloon, my usual approach for such balloon. cases yeah. is if it's a flush occlusion, I wire it. If post wiring there's flow and I'm able to see distal to the lesion, I yeah. don't aspirate yes. anymore. Correct. But if I wire it and I don't see anything, I tend to aspirate rather than balloon. And then see what I find uh, after aspiration. Although I think the evidence for routine aspiration is definitely not there. Yeah. Okay. And the two millimeter balloons a good idea. It gets you flow in those situations where you don't have flow to assess. The conries does look very clean though, which him, and there's no collaterals to the left. Mm -hmm. So I think Asho is onto something thinking that it could be embolic in nature. The enzymes actually bump up to CK, CKMB, and troponin are all elevated. So he definitely have a myocardial infarction. Sure. So, so what is your working diagnosis here? Uh, uh, embolism or, or, or AMI or whatever? <clears throat> will so, you ever so aspirate? We'll, we'll aspirate? I'm going to show you the results after aspiration. Okay, Chris, what do you think? I think the whole thing is probably still in keeping with an embolus. I guess the ECG initially showed a very proximal LED kind of occlusion. And when you did your angiogram, you see a very distal uh, disease. So that makes you wonder whether it was a, uh, the embolus went further distally. And that's why you see what you find on the angiogram, which is a bit discordant from your ECG findings. And I think the fact that when you've aspirated it and it looks very clean, I think, again, it puts it more likely that it's an emboli for now. Anand, any other comments? Uh, no, I agree with Chris. Professor Ashok? Yeah, I, I mean, I won't go with the fact that the, I think it fits in with the EKG. Had it been a very proximal LED occlusion at any stage, uh, you would have actually seen ST elevation in even V2 and sometimes even as, high, as early as V1, which is practically left main occlusion. So I think it was, if this was V3, V4, V5 that you had the more, most of the ST elevation. I think it fits in with that, that, that uh, occlusion itself. And uh, yeah, embolic occlusion comes to the mind. And now we're so going to look I at think, why I did think, he have an embolic occlusion? Mm -hmm. So where I did think Ashton, Yeah, I think there was a few pointers here. One is there's a bridging segment there, the artery taper sound right at the uh, bridging segment where you're occluded. And I, I think you will get a better hint when you see what comes out of the aspirate. You probably can get a hint of whether this is a fresh clot or some form of embolic uh, material. So it'd be nice to see what came out when you aspirated, Richie. Some, some whitish material didn't, didn't bother to even keep. Uh, so uh, uh, nothing was mentioned by the operator actually as to what was retrieved. Uh, maybe maybe something that was not there or he didn't, he didn't think there was anything significant. But what test would you do now? I mean, how are you going to improve your diagnosis? Chris, again, what's the workout? I guess intravascular, you can image, just to make sure there's no signs of an acute blood rupture, just to be sure that you're not missing anything angiograph. Uh, and then if you want, you could even do an echocardiogram just to make sure there's no signs of any intracardiac thrombus. And those would be the preliminary kind of cardiac investigations that I would do at this point. Dr. Anand? I would like to start my workup with the echocardiogram to look for any uh, intracardiac uh, shunt or so, 
uh, the cause of this thrombus? So holes in the heart, clots, and Correct. maybe even valvular issues. Yes. Uh, okay. Is it common? Yeah. Four, four points. Arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, holes in the heart, yeah, thrombus in the, in the cavities, and uh, valvular disease. Yeah, that's... And, and by the way, let's not forget homocysteine increase in uh, uh, protein S, protein C, antithrombin 3, and homocysteine. Hmm. It would be strange for somebody who's completely well to have an LV thrombus suddenly. Uh, sure. Yeah. And apart from the valvular heart disease, uh, and, and, and uh, if uh, he had uh, ear for uh, LA thrombus, right. LA or LA appendix thrombus. So we, we do an echo, how about that? Yeah. Yeah. This is an echo. This is showing the apex uh, is hypokinetic. He definitely infected, you agree? Hmm. Not too bad, I would say. Yeah, uh, fairly distal uh, yeah. MI here. No clots, right, the apex. Right, okay. but next picture. Wow. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this, this is more dramatic then. So, yeah. uh, but we'll pitch down the line, we'll go Anand first. So this is a parasternal short axis view. And there's a homo long there's axis view. Yeah, yeah parasternal long axis view. There's an echogenic density on the mitral leaflet. So this appears to be uh, uh, mobile echogenic density uh, at the mitral leaflet. Your diagnosis? So, Differential diagnosis, maybe. So it could be thrombus. It could be uh, it could be tumor. So these are the two. Uh, it's unlikely a vegetation. The third okay. one. Okay. Uh, thanks, Anand. Chris, what's your one diagnosis? Probably a myxoma, but I'm just curious what we aspirated out from the thromboaspiration, whether it was a clot or a fragment of the myxoma. I'm just curious. So maybe we can move on to Ashok, professoral yeah. diagnosis. Huh. This is, I mean, it's it's not typical of myxoma. I mean, this is, or, or it, it's just got too many fragments on it. It's almost too shaggy for a myxoma, but it still could be a myxoma with a lot of thrombus. It does seem to be pedunculated because it's moving in and out. Uh, there's, there is no other reason for this patient to have a left atrial uh, clot unless he had some form of a, a heart muscle disease. So I'd go for myxoma, but it looks more like thrombus to me. Yeah, so if you ask me, this patient is in sinus rhythm, the yeah. nature of the mitral valve looks fairly normal. Uh, I don't see any color here, but I presume there's some regurg. I will go with myxoma. There may be a peduncle coming off of the atrial wall that we're not seeing on this view. So the front-like no. appearance, the fact that it did embolize some, I mean, it agrees with the history. Um, I, I will go with myxoma. How okay. frequent does myxoma embolize to the coronary? It's actually much easier to embolize to the brain, to the rest of the uh, systemic vasculature than to go into the coronary. Yeah, you're right. So I'll check for other places where they embolize as well. <laughs> but but which, uh, you know, rarity, it does happen. Uh, mm -hmm. So so LA thrombus uh, is known to go into the coronaries. You think it goes more to the left or go to more to the right coronary? Yeah. <laughs> but either is possible. The... Goes more to the right, but either is possible. If the, the blood flow is such that it probably aim towards the right, if anything, is it? Yeah, but I, I agree, Ashok. I think you can go either if yeah. you analyze. Yeah, that's right. I want to show you the other view. It's yeah. really mobile, you know. I'm very irregular in the surface. Hmm. It's more irregular than I would have thought for a myxoma. That's all. That's right. What other tumors do we know in the heart? Hmm. Okay, this more, Chris, you are one for ACC uh, Jeopardy. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, I guess the other difference should be a papillary fibroelastoma, but it's quite big for one. Uh, Anand, any other differential? That's a good one, Chris. Uh, uh, I'm, I don't think, I don't know. Okay, that's also a good answer. So, uh, 
whatever it is, I think it has to come out, right? So we'll get a histological diagnosis ultimately. Uh, Hui Jin? So this is uh, the other pictures uh, for chamber view. Clearly this thing is popping through the uh, mitral valve, you know, at risk of uh, throwing off more things actually. So you're the right. Thing that, the other thing I felt I missed is that for such a large tumor, Usually in the coronary angiogram, you'll see a feeding artery usually you know, brighten up. I, when I look at the angiogram, I didn't have any hints that I miss a feeding artery though. So uh, well, that, that was surprising to me. More pedunculated than sessile. See. You know, mm -hmm. when you sessile, you have more blood. This is, this is like holding on to something. It's going to mm -hmm. go up. Maybe that's the reason. But indeed, this is a left atrial myxoma with coronary embolism. Let me tell you that this is an extremely uncommon situation. First of all, primary tumors of the heart are rare. Prevalence is only 0.02% in autopsy series. And 75% of cardiac tumors are benign. And myxoma accounts for 50% and rhabdomyoma uh, accounts for 20% of the benign tumors. The majority of the cardiac myxomas are sporadic and mostly occur as an isolated lesion in middle-aged women. So 75% of cardiac mesomas arise from the left atrium, 20% of them from the right atrium, 5% in both the atrial and the ventricle. And cardiac mesomas can produce symptoms by intracardiac obstruction, such as mitral stenosis, coronary embolizations, systemic embolization, or systemic constitutional manifestations, fever, fatigue, and so forth. So actually there have been a number of case reports of cardiac misoma that are presenting with uh, acute myocardial infarction. But let me also say that systemic embolization is actually more common than the coronary artery embolization. Coronary artery embolization accounts for 0.06% of uh, embolism in uh, patients with left atrial myxoma. So it's an extremely rare condition. In the majority of cases, it's the cerebral arteries and the retinal arteries which are affected. And the low incidence of coronary embolizations may be explained by the perpendicular position of the coronary arterial by the aortic leaflets in systole. You can imagine it's perpendicular, so it's very hard for the thrombi to go into the coronary. And among the patients that present a myocardial infarction, actually RCA infarct is the commonest, it's 47%. LAD is 10% and circumflex is about 10% as well. So what you're looking at here is an exceedingly uncommon AMI in the LAD territory. So a high incidence of embolization to RCA may be due to the conducive position of the right arsteum relative to the aortic blood flow. So this is a acute myocardial infarction. There's a first manifestation of left atrial myxoma, and you will suspect a embolism when patient has got no risk factors. It's got normal findings on the angiogram, and then you have a lobulated surface of a left atrial myxoma, which suggests of an embolic origin for the infarct. So I have another question for for maybe the fellows, what are the other common sites of uh, uh, tumor embolisms into the coronary artery? What are the common cancers that can cause a tumor embolism into the coronary artery? <laughs> Not coming from the heart. Chris, you want to answer a guess? Through the coronaries, well, I think Tumors that extend into the IVC would be things like your renal cell carcinoma, uh, things like your hepatocellular carcinomas, and I'm, but that's IVC extension rather than to the coronaries. So I don't know. I'll, I'll stick with those, although they don't really go to the coronaries. Anand, do you have uh, any experience? So do cancers... Uh embolized into the coronary arteries? So it's unlikely, that, uh, but the, I think the renal cell carcinoma is the most common one which embolized to the coronaries. To the lungs maybe, but uh, to the coronaries, it's a bit unusual. So. Professor Ashok, you have any experience? Uh, no, no, I don't. Uh, uh, lung tumor scan. Uh, that's one of the causes, but apart from that, uh, which is, uh, and that's sometimes direct invasion causing embolism. Uh, there's nothing else that I can think of. 
So you're actually correct. Uh, so the two commonest uh, tumors that uh, cancer that uh, can cause coronary tumor embolisms are from the lungs as well as from the breast. Right. And so sometimes uh, when you do an angiogram, this may show up. So that's what uh, Jack is talking about. You see this blood supply? Mm. This is my collection. This is amazing. Yeah. So without doing an echo, you already know he's got a myxoma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's the vascular supply. But this is a sessile tumor. Hmm. Any comment? Or... Any uh, last words from Ashok on this? Uh, no, very, very interesting. I mean, you're really yeah. producing some, some very, I mean, look at the rarity of that case. Uh, for an LED embola, you, you're talking about 0.06% having coronary embolism. And out of that, 10% out of that have an LED uh, em embolic episode. Now look at the rarity of that in a, in a case of myxoma. So we really looked at perhaps one in a 10,000 case out there. Mm. Yeah, Very good. Very good. Make, makes me excited experience. about case three now. <laughs> so uh, well, we change case yeah. three, please. Yeah. So it's, it's a good learning experience for us, not a teaching experience, uh, <laughs> <which> even... <laughs> <laughs> This is the 44-year-old Vietnamese lady so with hypertension and hyperlipidemia and then presented with sudden onset of chest pain uh, six days ago, actually flew to Singapore in an ambulance for further treatment. And that's the ECG. So Dr. Erin uh, from Malaysia is in. I'm not too sure whether you're able to broadcast yourself, if you can. If not, uh, maybe we start with Chris again. What do you think of the ECG, Chris? Lady with uh, ECG. Well, I think in consistent with the history, it looks like if anything, there's some loss of R waves in the anterior leads. Um, but I wouldn't say it's like an acute STEMI. So given her presentation that the chest pain was six days ago, I assume she's chest pain free yeah. at this point. So I don't think at this point there's any rush to go in with a coronary evaluation at this point. I mean, what I'll probably start off with, with would be enzymes and maybe um, an echocardiogram first. But um, I would think that I'll eventually evaluate the coronaries at some point as well. Uh, LAD probably suspect. Dr. Anand? Dr. Anand, you're muted. Uh, can you unmute yourself first? Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, they are poor R-wave progression, but they are tiny uh, ST elevation could be noted in lead AVF and lead three, uh, lead as two. So uh, it's unlikely that it's acute MI. I would like to go for troponins and echocardiogram. Also, the history I I would like to know what's a childbirth history, oral contraception, and stuff like that as well. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. maybe we move on. Yeah, so we brought her to the lab. <laughs> That's, I knew you were going to bring this up in one of the patients. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we, we don't give it away, okay, Ashok? Uh, we'd like yeah. to ask the fellows first. So uh, maybe Anand, you'd like to comment? What, what, do, you, what do you think? So uh, there's diffuse disease in the mid LED, and then there's, I think there's a dis dissection in the mid LED. Make this way already, yeah, good. Uh, Chris, what's your diagnosis? Yeah, I was going to go with SCAD, probably type 2, I think. Uh, Prof Ashok? Yeah. So this is spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Uh, that's right. Okay. Uh, which so this, is, this is a type 2. Not rare enough. Yeah. Would you intervene? Ashok, would you intervene? Oh, no, no. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, so, so of course, and you know, the way to prove it is, of course, more to do with uh, never, you know. I think uh, OCT would be the wrong thing to do in such situations. Yes, Ivas, you can if you want to prove it, but this is quite obvious. This is SCAD. This is quite obvious. I don't think you need to intervene. You just need to let it heal. That's, and this lady's got a flowing SCAD, so that's the important aspect. If it was not flowing, that would be another aspect. 
if this was a presentation with acute MI and the vessel was not staying open, then you could actually stent it. We've had experience of a, of a bioresorbable scaffold into a SCAD, which, was, which had tremendous outcomes over a long period of time, over a longer period of time. But on the other hand, if it's a flowing vessel, it's just to be left alone. Hmm. It's sometimes quite hard to stand a long dissected segment. Of it heals up. That's well recognized. Hmm. This is the other view. So at this point in time, uh, what we do? What should we do? Um, so alone, to Asha, how, how would you treat this patient? So so okay. So so you so, so if, it, if if it's to me, I would just put the patient on anticoagulation, and that's about it. Uh, and uh, leave the patient alone. The patient showed that she'd lost R waves across anterior leads, but was not having acute chest pain. It's still a flowing vessel, and I'd just let it heal. So I'll show you. Give her the post MI therapy, post MI therapy, definitely. All the other adjunctive post MI therapy. What's so the ejection you, fraction of this patient? Uh, it's about 40 over. Yeah, this, I thought so. Yeah, go ahead. So Ashok, you're mentioning anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy? Yeah, I, I was uh, in this sort of situation, I would be worried about my only worry would be in that uh, partially occlusive vessel, is this patient going to form thrombus? So I'm not, I'm, I'm in more in favor of anticoagulation therapy in this patient than antiplatelet therapy. Okay, Eugene, maybe you take us through. So this is a LV gram certainly showing a apical infarct here. Okay, so it so definitely have a acute myocardial infarction. And so this is spontaneous coronary artery dissections indeed. And we know that as scared is a rare cause of ACS, a series of 0.1 to 4% can present a sudden cardiac death as well. Prevalence is high in young women with ACS. So when you have a woman of less than 50 years old presenting with AMI, a quarter of them will have a scare as a etiology. It is a spontaneous, non-traumatic, and non-iatrogenic separation of the coronary artery wall by intramural hemorrhage. Now, the creation of this false lumen with intramural hematoma can propagate anti and retrogradely as well, compressing arterial lumen to varying degree, causing ischemia or infarction. There are two proposed uh, patterns uh, mechanism here. One is either you have an initial intermal tear that lead to a propagating medial dissection, or you have a dissecting medial hematoma. So there are actually uh, three classifications, uh, three distinct angiographic patterns of SCAD. Type one is your evident arterial wall stain, which is our patients. It's actually pathognomonic. So you see contrast dye staining of the arterial wall with multiple radiolucent lumens. Type two is when you have a diffuse stenosis of varying severity. So you find that this patient actually gets, has got normal looking artery proximal distal, and in, in the middle, it's almost as though you have a significant uh, stenosis here. So you have an abrupt demarcation from a normal proximal segment that do not respond to intracoronary nitroglycerin. A type three uh, angiographic patterns is when patient actually has long lesions, hazy disease, linear stenosis. So it could be focal, it could be tandem jumping, and there's lack of atherosclerosis uh, in other coronary arteries. So this is in the nutshell, angiographic classifications cartoon drawn by my uh, fellow colleague. So you have a uh, type one, which is your torn artery. Type two is your long diffuse narrowing, which is the commonest, 67% of cases. And type three, which will be your uh, sometimes focal uh, tubular stenosis, which you may mistake for a uh, atherosclerotic disease. So this is a type two when you have pretty much a normal artery and then suddenly becomes narrow and then grow bigger again. But this, this patient has got a bit of a distal occlusion as well. And so treatment is mostly conservative and six months later, you find that the artery is completely healed. So what I want to say that if you want to attempt a PCI in a scan, there are certain considerations. First of all, catheter manipulation has to be careful and engagement because you don't want to cause a further iatrogenic dissection and you want to have a gentle contrast injection. And uh, when you want to wire such vessels, best not to use a 
hydrophilic wire. So use a non-hydrophilic. And then uh, you want to prevent further dissection. If it's a timid flow zero, uh, use a small size balloon to try to restore the coronal wave flow. Best to use intracoronary imaging guidance to distinguish between true and false lumen in where your artery is, uh, where your wire is. And certainly intravascular ultrasound imaging is preferred to uh, OCT. When you decide to stand, uh, try not to aim for one-to-one -one size, particularly when you have a huge uh, compressing hematoma. And you want to do gentle stand dilatation, do not optimize, don't try to expand the stand to as much as, as big as you can. Uh, best to use intracoronary imaging to look at the vessel size. So the main goal is really to just restore normal blood flow. Uh, if you can avoid stand, that would be best. But if you want to stand it, just do it in the proximal segment and not in the distal uh, vasculature. So when you have a patient with a compressing intramural hematoma, you can consider the following thing. You can consider a cutting balloon so to fenestrate the intermal medial flap so that the blood can flow out or you can do a stage procedure to allow the hematoma to resolve and then you can reassess again and see what's happening. Sometimes people talk about self-expandable stent, uh, but this is not commonly done at all. So this is scan, And this is on IVUS. You can see that there's a false lumen here and a true lumen here. On I OCT, which is usually not recommended, uh, you can see that there's a tear in the endothelium here and then you can see a false lumen and this is a true lumen. And this is the intramural hematoma on OCT. So the long-term treatment management uh, really is quite different from the usual atherosclerotic disease. <clears throat> you will consider beta blocker as a maintenance therapy to control hypertension. And then you can talk about discussion with regard to exercise and reproductive counseling. But the important thing is that you should really go and uh, look up this patient if he's has got uh, fibromuscular dysplasia as well. And finally, to improve quality of life, a lot of these patients may have concomitant psychosocial disorders. So some kind of management uh, will be necessary. Thanks, Wee Jim. That was really something that needs to be emphasized again. Thanks for showing us this case. Because I see a lot of chats from the fellows attending. A lot of people pitch that stenting, go ahead and stent it. So I think Ashok's point needs to be re-emphasized. If you do make those diagnoses, one option when there's flow is let it recover and some form of anti or anticoagulation and uh, the therapy that you mentioned. Recognition is probably key in this rather than trying too hard. I think sometimes it leads to massive complication. Not everyone is very good at wiring dissections, I would say. Um, any other points on Ashok? Yeah, yeah. Right and, 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 you know, uh, stenting is only reasonable for occlusive SCAD uh, which is creating an infarction, provided you recognize it. And what Hui Chim pointed out is very important, that if you actually start chasing the SCAD, you actually put, push the hematoma further and further down. And occasionally you may end up using a cutting balloon to, to remove that hematoma. So it's best only to stand the entry point to just restore flow and not try and stand the whole segment because either you continue the dissection up further downwards or you continue the the hematoma, which continues to creep distally uh, and occlude the vessel further. Thanks, uh, Ashok. So in the last 10 minutes, we'd like to finish up the last case, which is... Yeah. Okay. 82-year-old <clears throat> Chinese lady, no risk factor, presented with intermittent chest pain. Okay, we'll go down the line again. Uh, Chris. Uh some ST elevations anteriorly. Uh, I don't know how convincing the history is. Uh, if I'm not too convinced, I may opt to repeat the ECG in about five minutes just to look for any evolution of changes. But if in doubt, I'll bring her to the cath lab. Since uh, this presentation on MIs. Dr. Anand? Uh, yes, there are ST elevation in V3, V4, and 5V6, but there are no reciprocal ST depression. And uh, as the patient having intermittent chest pain, I would like to have cardiac enzyme and the repeat ECG after 10 minutes. Okay. Would you bring it to the lab or, yeah. or, or you wait and see? Uh, I will uh, like to have an ECG after 10 minutes and then I will bring to the cat lab if there are evolutionary changes. Also have a low threshold to call Ashok or do an echo yeah. first. Yeah. That's right. No, I've, I've, I'd look for other evidence. Uh, 
these are sort of, I, I mean, I would have, had this been a younger individual, I would have said absolutely that this is not, not an acute MI, she's 82. I'd look for other evidence of MI, I won't rush her to the cath lab straight away on this ECG. This is J-point elevation. I think there are many reasons to have that. So nobody believes that this is a ST elevation of MI? No, we don't exclude it. I think we need more evidence that it is a ST elevation of MI, not just on the EKG. Okay. <clears throat> Chris, if this is AMI, where do you think is the location of the lesion? Uh, it's either in the distal LED or maybe even a diagonal, maybe. But diagonal one and AVL are not quite elevated. Mildly, but yeah, that's where I would go with. Unless it's a quiet circle, of course, that's always your other differential. So distal LED, you think? Yeah, for now, bro. And then if this is the AMI, where do you think is the corporate lesion? I will go for LED and likely mid LED. Hmm. Asho, you agree? Yeah, I don't. No, I don't. I mean, yeah, that's that's certainly one of those, but it could be, it's, it's somewhere around the apex and that could also happen from a huge OM coming to the apex instead of the LED. So I think it's somewhere at the apex that this is, this is happening. So we brought her to the cap lab. What do you think? So Anand, um, what are your observations first on angiogram? So, so I, I, I do not find any, uh, any significant stenosis in LED. But beyond stenosis, uh, Chris, do you notice anything else? I mean, the apex is definitely not moving. Uh, the LED extends right to the apex as well. Mm -hmm. So the apex is mainly supplied by the LED. But other than that, no, other than the apex not moving, I think that's all I can see. And nothing high grade in the LED. Is this okay, I think, the op I think the operator is quite sure it's MI. I think it looks like a guider straight up. So... Um, uh, I, I also noted that the heart doesn't look like it's contracting that normally, but uh, other than that, don't see much. Uh, Ashok, do you see anything else? No, no, I don't. Nothing else that I can comment on. Anything else you would do now? And, and I would like to, you know, what about the other view? So, so you're telling us there's nothing in the LED, there's nothing in the circumflex as well? Yes. Anything else so, that you do? So what, what, what did the RC issue? This is normal. Okay, RC is normal as well. <clears throat> and I think LV gram could be the option as patient in the cath lab. So did this patient have any grief recently? Was this Taka Super for any reason? No known grief here. But no, no known, no known uh, <laughs> stress either. No known uh, stress factors, but this is acute setting, so... But LV gram, would you do, uh, Asho? Do you normally do uh, LV gram? No, I don't. And I, would, I wouldn't have done it. I would have just found my findings on the echocardiogram. Oh. So in this case, I, I think in this case, you know, it's a routine. Yeah. But in this yeah. case, if you can't find much and you are thinking of Takasubo, maybe worthwhile just getting a diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. You, you have a diagnosis on the table then. So I agree with Jack. In this case, though, routinely, I never do it. Uh, that's what I did, actually. Hmm. How long ago was this, uh, Wichim? You mean the symptom? or I, I mean this this case that you're showing us. Um, I, I can't quite remember. A couple of years, maybe. Okay. When I was still excited with this condition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what, what, what would be your diagnosis, Dr. Anand? The Taka Subocardiomyopathy. Yeah, of apical wall. There must be something more than Takosubo in a talk like this. So, <laughs> no, no. Okay. Uh, so what is the uh, criteria for Takosubo? May I know, Dr. Anna? Uh, sorry? Uh, what are the criteria, diagnostic criteria for Takosubo? So, are you uh, aware? Uh, no, so here I'm not there. So, uh, so this is indeed uh, Takosubo. 
uh, because if you look at the thoracic uh, echo, uh, there is again uh, apical dilatation and hypokinesia. So an echo, this is a uh, pretty uh, classic. Uh, not playing so well, but never mind. <clears throat> so again, you see LV dilatations and akinesia. Uh, to diagnose Takosubo cardiomyopathy, we have the Mayo Clinic diagnostic criteria. And this is uh, the criteria here. Uh, it's a transient LV systolic dysfunction with regional mall motion abnormality extending beyond a single coronary distribution. So you should have absence of obstructive coronary artery disease or any angiographic evidence of uh, acute plaque uh, rupture. So sometimes patients can have coronary artery disease uh, concomitantly, but the diagnosis of stress cardiomyopathy can still be made if the regional wall motion abnormality does not correspond to the distributions of the CAD. Uh, you should have a new ECG abnormality, ST elevations, T wave inversion, or modus elevations in troponin. You have to prove absence of pheochromocytoma or myocarditis, and patients almost certainly, if they survive, will have subsequent recovery of the EF. So actually, there are five types of warm motion abnormality. Uh, we are most familiar with the apical type, which is 80% of cases. Actually, there's a mid ventricular type, and there's a basal type as well. And there's a focal type. You know, this focal type, when you see somebody who has got this enterolateral, just have out pouching and so forth, think of a uh, uh, Takosubo cardiomyopathy of the focal type. So this is a patient with a mid ventricular uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, uh, Takosubo. So only the mid ventricle is high A kinetic, the base as well as the apex are contracting. And so we know that 90% of those affected are post-menopausal women, mean age of 70, often uh, but not always triggered by an intense emotional or physical stress. So it could be a negative stressor, grief, anger, fear, or life stressor, or physiologic trigger, respiratory distress, neurologic stroke, or something like that. Sometimes besides negative stressor, a uh, positive stressor can also cause Takosubo in case you don't know. There's this thing called the happy heart syndrome, the Diagoras uh, syndrome. So if you're too happy, you can also get Takosubo uh, heart attack. 4% of cases, uh, pleasant experience, oftentimes is a mid ventricular ballooning rather than an apical uh, ballooning. The Intertech Registry, uh, which is a worldwide registry for Takosuba, actually found a somewhat increased incidence of psychiatric disorder in this group of patients. 42% of them have some kind of mood and anxiety disorder, and there are actually more women uh, uh, than men that are getting this condition. So the presentation is chest pain, dyspnea, syncope, heart failure, arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, significant MR cardiogenic shock. So it mimics ACS completely. It accounts for 3% of ACS. Mortality is high, just like our AMI, 5% at 30 days. Long-term outcomes is at this point in time still unknown. May propose mechanism, maybe due to excessive catecholamines. Some people think it's a microvascular form of ACS. But few chromocytoma should be ruled out as well. So you should do some screening test for it. Plasma endothelin is thought to be reduced in this group of patients. So if you look at the ECG, ST elevation is the most common findings on the ECG. You can have some troponin and CK elevations as well. Echo will help you, but cardiac MIR is also a differentiating uh, test. When you have a Takosubo, you don't have late gadolinium enhancement, but when you have AMI, you get intense subendocardial or transmural late gadolinium enhancement. Myocarditis, you get patchy LG, but Takosubo, nothing of the sort. Okay, so diagnos diagnosis, uh, angiogram, 11 kilogram, very important. So this is an ECG of all my patients with Takosuba cardiomyopathy. And you can see that invariably, they all have ST segment elevation. Okay, so some of them looks pretty, pretty frightening actually. Almost like a usual uh, acute myocardial infarction of the wild type. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention and participation. These are my four cases of unusual AMI. So we'll, we'll get uh, Ashok to have his uh, professoral comments and uh, for this session first. Thank you, Eugene. I think they were, they were, they were uh, very, very informative cases. Uh, great collection. Made us all think, made us all not be, you know, working from a spinal level, but more from a brain level. Uh, dealing with acute MI and primary PCI has just become so much of a habit that the moment we all see an ST elevation pattern 
all we know is how to rush the patient in into the cath lab and then deal with any occlusive disorder that we actually see. Now this just reveals that there's a variety of presentations of different disease processes as acute MI and has also made us not just think more about it, but also made us revise uh, some of the concepts which we learned during our training days and have not come across so regularly in our practice. So when you bring up these rare cases, it just tells you that regularly we've got to remind ourselves of those rarer causes because there's a whole different way, different way to deal with, uh, with uh, such patients. It also helps us to brush up much of those learnings that we had over a period of time. So I think they were incredible. We should have more of this. And I would say it's educational for all. There are no professors in this and there are no students in this and there are no fellows in this. I think these are where we share learnings from each other because these are rarities and we need to continue to learn uh, as even however experience that we may get. So I think there's great teaching experience and great learning experience for all of us. Uh, Jack, great session organized. And I think I, I must comment also the, the fellows. I think they were thinking through every step. I think Hui Chim had warned that these are going to be rare cases. Believe you me, never go into a case thinking it's rare. Start thinking of the common things because I could see that all of us were faltering on the, even the diagnosis of acute MI when it was actually an acute MI <laughs> because we were looking too, more, too much deeply into whether this is an MI or not. So I think all of us also learned that first things first, go for whatever you think it is and then start sorting it out as you go along. So thanks, thanks I, I felt, uh, I should say it all, so I don't have to say much more, but I'd like to thank the team again and the fellows for participating. Hui Chim showed us some really rare ones. But one thing I like about Hui Chim's series of cases, he showed us things that is not so rare. It's uncommon, but not so rare. And thus, we do need to pick up on those cases like Takasubo, Scott, and all this. And he showed us great variety of these cases through his 25 years of experience. And I really particularly like his summary. It was a couple of slides, but it really captured all the facts you need to know as an interventional fellow, cardiology fellow on the respective conditions. So uh, I'm looking forward to the next professor around with Hui Chim. The next series, Hui Chim, uh, what do you intend to do with us? I think I will share with you my years of collections of coronary anomalies. <laughs> so look out for it. Uh, we have agreed we have had two sessions on unusual cases of AMI. The next uh, session we'd like to have from Hui Chim is unusual coronary or structural anomalies. So watch out for those uh, sessions coming up. And I'd like to thank everyone for their time and participating for the whole duration of the session. Um, thanks a lot and uh, keep safe, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.